All right, so welcome back. We are going to be talking for this segment, Hot Knot or Sanctified. Um, so just to kind of review what the rules are for this uh, game is we're going to be discussing some different topics or sometimes we talk about people or theological um, ideas and we go around we decide if we think that topic or idea or person or situation is hot, not, or sanctified. If we are saying it is hot, we're saying it is a hot uh, theological inspiration, obviously not, then means it's not. And then sanctified is that only God's sanctified judgment can make the call. It's not that that we think that that specific issue is sanctified, but merely only God can decide. So those are kind of the rules and we can get into it. All right. And remember to check out Kingdom of the Logos on YouTube and Facebook, but you can also check us out on Instagram and Tumblr and a few other places. You can follow me on Twitter at J. Dylan Proctor. And if you'd like to donate to our program, you can do that at patreon.com slash kingdom of the Logos. Anthony, what are we going to be looking at today? It'll be a selection of art. And as follows, the first one is Stephen Sawyer is by Stephen Sawyer and named Cavalry. The second is named The Finding of Moses, dated back to 1650 by Sebastian Bourdon. The third one is named The Exorcism of the Garrison Demoniac, dated back to 1653, also by Sebastian Bourdon. And lastly, we have The Christ Child Trampling on Sin, dated back to 1616 all the way to 1671. As Anthony went through this list today, I realized these are going in order of my favorite from least to favorite. <laughs> uh, but anyways, let's jump right into this. So the first one is by Stephen Sawyer called Calvary. Now, this really is an interesting piece of art, totally different from the others. It's a huge contrast to the others. And basically what you've got is a man who's there. You see this painting. It's a man wearing what's almost ashen washed blue jeans, but not quite. He's got on a black sort of tank top. He's got tattoos on him. He's injecting himself in the arm with a needle. And Jesus is reaching around as if he is feeling the pain of the man. And his arm almost meshes with the man's arm. You can't tell. Is this supposed to be Jesus' arm that he's injecting or is he injecting his own arm? It's really bizarre to look at. So, guys, what do you all think about this? Is it hot, not a sanctified? What all details stick out to you in this piece of art? Well, I'll, I'll go first, I guess. I, I think for me, my, my initial reaction is not because, um, and I understand I come to this painting with my own lenses and perceptions, and it just seems highly manipulative to me. And I understand art always um, kind of is supposed to, you know, produce a response. So in that sense, almost all art is manipulative, but this takes it to, to a place that I think is un, unwise and, and faulty. And then also it just... It's just mediocre Christian art <laughs> on top of that. But yes, and then you have the thing with the Jesus. It, is it Jesus being empathetic or are we saying that somehow we're re-crucifying Christ or that Christ has now been drawn into our sin versus understanding that Christ, yes, he took on our sins, but that was so that um, even sin could be redefined, that, that sin could be conquered and, and we could be transformed. And so I think there's there's some bad theological things behind this. There's some bad conclusions then become of that and then it's just kind of meh art well let's let's talk about this sort of <laughs> angle of manipulation real quick just for a second because again if art is actually good it will trick your brain into thinking that you're a part of it it'll pull you into it so there is an element that our art especially if it's good will have some capacity to say manipulate but the sentiment we normally have with the word manipulation is there's some sort of bad motive or something mm -hmm. awry there and I, I think you're onto something amanda that this has some element of that and in our conversation, when we were getting prepared for the show, I can't remember the exact phrase you had used, but it was talking a little bit about communion and how this is backwards to all that. And I was looking at this and I was like, this is almost reverse transubstantiation. And if you're not familiar with what transubstantiation it is, it's when people take the sacraments, literally the bread and the wine or grape juice, whatever you're using in styrofoam, it's actually turning into Jesus's bone and flesh. Well, in this, it looks like the man is turning into this man, injecting himself. And I think Amanda's right. There's some huge problem here because instead of this man being elevated to the holiness of Christ or even being transformed by Christ at all, we don't see any transformation out of suffering or any repentance, but we see Christ being transformed into the suffering. So it's almost completely opposite of the story of the gospel. Instead of it saying Jesus comes to you, 
He meets you where you're at and takes you to a better place. In other words, it's saying Jesus comes, meets you where you're at. He sees you're in a bad place and Jesus says, well, I'm going to reject everything I have and I'm going to take on your nastiness and I'm going to be nasty now and just sort of stays and ends there. So, yeah. Anthony, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, so at first I was a tentative hot. I definitely agreed that there were some theological issues here, but I did think that at least, you know, at first anyways, I thought that the only sentiment provided was that whenever we sin, we're causing Christ to suffer. And I was like, okay, well, that can be something that I can get behind. But whenever I noticed that the title was Calvary, which I totally flew over my head at first, but whenever I noticed that, that the title was Calvary, then it does really um, totally change the message of the picture because then it's trying to lay a message for theology concerning the crucifixion. And obviously, as Amanda was saying as well, the crucifixion was for much more than just to atone for sin, but it was also for transformation. So that's why now I would say not. Yeah, it's definitely, this is an image representing transformation into sin, in my opinion. And I, I don't like that. And again, it looks like something someone would impulse buy. You get all the stereotypic st stuff there. It looks like he's been playing Russian roulette. He's got cards. I can't really figure out why there's just a skull there. Um, <laughs> or the candle or the lamp. And if somebody can figure out why there's a handprint on the door, maybe he's slamming the door shut. I don't know. Send us your thoughts about this. Again, put them in the comment section or hit me up in a private message or Twitter or something. But let us know what you think about this. Hot, not, or sanctified. Amanda said not. Anthony said not. I'm definitely saying not as well. Um, I oh, wish we could debate this one. but Yeah, something we I just noticed. The, the author, or I'm sorry, the artist, like carved his name into the, the table. Yeah. And then Calvary is also engraved in the other table. And I, I don't know, maybe this came from a more personal place. And if we knew the artist's history, maybe we could recognize what he was trying to say. But yeah, just at face value, this is... It looks like something a new Christian mm -hmm. would impulse buy. Yeah. Is really what I, I or think like about a bad, it. a bad evangelist would use. Like there would yeah, be like yeah. a, an out of context verse on the back and he would hand it to you instead of actually giving you a tip at a restaurant. Like yeah. that's what this seems to yeah, me. Yeah, it does. Because <laughs> everything in this is a little bit derelict. Um, except for the lamp and the candle. So they're really out of place here. Even the wall, the, which looks a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. And then you've got the, the derelict baseboard. It's just all terrible. All right. Well, let's move on with our lives to something a bit more <laughs> stimulating. Sebastian Bourdon, a 17th century artist. And I, one that I really like, I really like the artwork of this. So let's move along to the finding of Moses. And so here we've got a 17th century depiction of Moses being found. And if you're not familiar with the story of Exodus, Moses is really one of the heroes there and really one of the important archetypes in the Old Testament. But what we see happening is Moses being found. You see these very healthy looking Egyptian women and a few children coming to meet Moses there. You see the baby Moses being handed out of the, the water there by some Jewish men who do not look anywhere near as healthy as these ladies do. Uh, maybe it's just the colors of the image I have, but one of the man's uh, one of the men, the one to the left, he almost looks like he's one ring away from being Gollum <laughs> in a cave, but also he's a little bit green. And if you look across the water, you can see what looks like Jewish slaves working in the background, making bricks and things. And then you see all of the Egyptian civilization even further behind. But this really does stimulate your mind and it draws your eyes to the point where the child is being brought up. So Amanda, we'll start with you. What do you think about this? Well, I think something that, like, what I first noticed of this painting is how the characters are depicted. They don't, you don't look at this and go, ah, Egypt, Egypt right? Because there's these, you know, green rolling hills in the background there. It looks like there's some kind of castle, but again, it looks maybe a little more European. Um, and the way they're dressed is, is kind of Grecian or European as well. And if we think about the era and the, the style of painting that this is, in which this is taking place, it was very common to do that. And so, yeah, it's not very historically accurate, but I, I was just thinking maybe this is inviting the audience to find themselves in the story. And like you were mentioning, like you see, it looks almost flat in the background, but then you look and you see all these details of, of very two different things that are happening. Um, there are the rich that um, have a lot of the power, and then you have these the slaves that um, have can do nothing but abandon their children and, and hope that there's something better for them within the palace. Um, so yeah, it, it's, I don't know. I, I think it's very interesting. And, and originally like I, this kind of art, I'm not really drawn towards. 
And so I was like, yeah, this is a painting. Um, but the more we talk about it, the more you look at it, you really do find some really great, interesting concepts that would that makes it, I think, theologically very hot. All right. Anthony? I would say hot. And I would say this because it's not it's not making some moral argument here or anything like that. But it is creating sort of like a vi a visual chronicle of a pretty important moment in pretty much one could argue human history. Yeah. So I would say hot, even though I totally agree that it's not exactly accurate, at least with the clothing. <laughs> Egypt might have been more green or something like that. But the clothing is definitely off. Well, one of the things I think is fascinating about Sebastian Bourdon is he's not known for having a particular style. This is one of the reasons why he's not one of the more famous painters from this area is, or era because he, he started off, he trained, and he copied a few different styles as he was training, and he found a few different things to, to use as models for himself. And he doesn't have a consistent theme across his artwork. But one of the things that I do find consistent in Sebastian Bourdon's artwork is he's able to, in very good taste, bring the elements of a historical event or a person together without stepping on himself. Like if you go back to that past painting we looked at with uh, Stephen Sawyer, like there's the skull there and the candle and it just it steps all over itself. It can't help from going to the level of gaudy. But with this finding of Moses here, there is the implied lines which take you to the focal point of the painting, which is Pharaoh's daughter accepting Moses out of the river. But what's interesting is you can't really decide, is the child the focal point or is it the daughter who is willing to accept this child that's the focal point? In other words, it takes you there, but it doesn't spend so much time on the focal point as much as it draws your mind to really the peripherals of that focal point. In other words, there's these very downtrodden Jewish people who are even they're having to give up their children. Their children are being taken from them and even killed. And there's this love and healthy young Pharaoh's daughter who's taking this child in. It's those peripheral actions which you're sucked into. And I think that is so theologically inspiring. It's definitely a haunt for me. Well, let's move on to the next painting. Uh, one I like a little bit more, the exorcism of the garrison demoniac. And if you Follow some of the material here. I do at Jolted Church of the Nazarene. We just did a study on this out of Mark where we see the demon legion. And if you're familiar with the story where Jesus, he comes to this man, he's out at the tombs, he's in chains, and there's these demons inside him. They're tormenting him. He's cutting himself, screaming. He rips out of the chains. Jesus comes on the picture. The demons say, our name is Legion. They don't want to be sent out of the country. Jesus sends them into a group of pigs and they run off the cliff and they die. Well, here we see Jesus with that man, and I'm just going to let Amanda go ahead and give her thoughts on this, and we'll come around, because if I get talking too much about this, <laughs> I'll go on forever. What do you think about this, Amanda? Um, you know, I was thinking the more uh, about this painting. I, I recently read uh, for my devotionals this story, but in, in the Gospel of Luke, and I've been doing my devotionals through something that does the Bible with visuals, and they have actors that kind of portray it. Anyways, and they, they, they have like this... In the video I was watching, a very dramatic standoff, right? Just like, I don't know, lights flashing and the earth shaking or the camera shaking. Anyways, and, and then in this one, there seems to be a piece about this, right? Like, Jesus is leaning back. He's not, you know, he's not, he doesn't have this aggressive stance. And the way that uh, Sebastian Bourdon kind of paints Jesus is like, this is just a normal Tuesday. Like, we're just healing uh, demoniacs. Um, and, and I think I like this interpretation of the passage better than I, I do others simply because of that, that this is not a struggle for Jesus. Um, this is what Jesus does and it just comes naturally. So I, I really enjoy and find this painting to be um, hot theologically. Uh, Anthony, what do you think? Definitely hot. And this is, um, this is my favorite of today in regards to the lesson being taught, just visually pleasing, generally all around, this is my favorite. If I was going to own one of what we were going to talk about today, it would be this one. And I just think there's so many obvious reasons. I, it's really well done, and I love all the very small, almost Easter egg uh, details. <laughs> you've got the pigs in the background, you've got the very obvious uh, John the Revelator with his book in red cloth. Which, it's also strange that Jesus is wearing blue, but um, I'm interested to learn more about it and why. Uh, there's a seemingly yellow cloth in the ground, which 
we talked earlier before about it, and it may just be a dirty, uh, corrupted white cloth or something. But I think it's a, you could form an interesting argument that that's a yellow cloth cast to the ground. And um, that's symbolic as well. There's just a lot going on, and I like it. Well, one of the things that I really like about this, and Anthony said hot, Amanda said hot. I'm going to say hot as well. If you look at this, it's a absolutely fantastic painting. Again, Sebastian Bourdon never steps on himself. You're not distracted by the pigs in the background or the civilization. But what you see is Jesus coming to bless this man. And civilization in the background just almost is unknown to it. It's almost like it's just a benign aspect of creation where it has no idea the looming um, magnitude of, of the coming of Jesus. As his ministry unfolds, as they're getting close to the cross, they just don't know what is what is coming next out of this man. But if you watch the implied lines, whether you're following the hands of the, the three figures on the right or you're following the just the implied lines throughout the picture, it, it all points to Jesus. However, the depiction of Jesus in the middle is not captivating because of necessarily the, the quality of it, though it's, it's a very good piece of art, the, the figure of Jesus himself in this painting. But it's not something like the Mona Lisa where you're just in awe of the, the amount of work put into this figure or even something like uh, David or something like that when you look at a statue and you say this is so well capturing the person. Sebastian Bourdon doesn't just capture Jesus there. He captures the actions and ministry of Jesus. Your eyes are drawn to Jesus, but you don't focus on the fact that there's a man in a blue robe there. Your eyes are focused on the fact that there's a man who is just unbelievably being blessed right now. You see him looking up to heaven. You see the men next to him just in sort of bewilderment and confusion about what's going on. You see the pigs fleeing into the sea. And again, as Amanda said, Jesus is just there as if this is any other day of the week. You are drawn to the focus of the, the painting. But the focus of the painting is not what Jesus looks like. It's not the aesthetic of Jesus. But instead, it is the ministry of Jesus that you are drawn to in that. And I think that is so amazingly well done. Well, we have one more for us to look at. And it's not so much a painting as it is a bit of a sketch. And this is the last one we're going to look at from Sebastian Bourdon. And it is not clearly dated. It's dated from 1616 to 1671. <laughs> um, Bourdon did a lot of different things in his life. And he was a Protestant. And he kind of grew up poor. He had some efforts. He tried to join the army. And he ended up going to Rome and then having to flee there because of what Catholics were doing to Protestants in that day and age. And he, he ended up being a royal painter for, for one of the queens, um, I think Queen Christina, Queen Christina, if I can get that out. Very, very interesting man. But what we see happening here in this painting or picture of the Christ child trampling on sin. It's a very fascinating piece. And actually, this is the most captivating one we've looked at so far. As you'll notice here, you may be in a bit of confusion as to what Jesus is actually standing on. And of course, this is the baby Jesus standing there. Um, what sin is, is a bit ambiguous. If you come in close and we've got an up close of this, you can see that it's actually a serpent. But when you step back and look at this piece as a whole, it's almost confusing to figure out what the child is on, but yet your eyes are drawn to that focal point and you're not tore up on what the serpent exactly looks like as much as you are the actions and the gestures of Jesus. Amanda, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I really like this painting, especially I like it in contrast with the first painting. Um, you know, the first painting, I think, really kind of pushes towards this idea of, of I don't know, the substitution theory of, of Jesus just kind of simply being taking on our sin so we don't have to and there may be some elements we even find that in some of our, our gospels and then in our in pauline uh in his letters where he talks about that as you know christ being sacrificed but really what this painting then moves us towards is more than just that christ came to take on our sins but what happens because he does that and we really see in this this idea this latin uh, term Christus Victus, which is basically Christ is victorious, Christ conquers. And so this painting, I think, takes us to a better place theologically, where again, we're seeing sin being trampled, the, the destructive factors are now held so low and so underneath of Christ that he, like, look at the painting of Jesus' face. He's giggling, and his mom is so nonchalant. And we were kind of debating on who the man is in the background. 
Um, I would assume it's Joseph or supposed to be Joseph, but he's not even paying attention. He's just chilling. And it's like, because sin becomes so nothing compared to who Christ is. And so I really, I love this, this sketch, um, especially compared to the other one, because if we're going to show somebody art for them to have a reaction and say, ah, I want to be a participant in this faith, this is better. This is better. <laughs> and just to clarify, Amanda says... Hot. All right, Anthony... All right, I would definitely say hot on this as well. My take on the man on the side, I think he is likely a man who is um, suffering from some amount of sin, whether or not it's just a sin in the world or his own sin, whichever it is. I think he looks emaciated. He's laying on the ground. The book is something that's questionable as well. I wonder what the book is about. But even his hands, his hands look crippled and... Jesus' face as well, you all were saying that he looked uh, gleeful. I think he almost looks kind of like concerned and like he's like going out of his way to be like, these are my first steps, but they're also going to be to step on this snake. Yeah, I think that's like, interesting that Anthony points out. Of course, this depiction of the Christ child is way bigger than an infant would be when it starts walking <laughs> or a toddler. But um, then again, Christ in iconography is often painted large. And Amanda's talked about that some before. Um, but as we, we get to this point, we see... Christ, he does look happy. He's almost giggly, in in my opinion. And if we can pull up the up close of the serpent again, the serpent looks almost like an eastern dragon, like this ancient, exhausted sort of thing. And this new child sort of is giggly, happy, just nonchalantly uh, trampling on it. It's, it's fun. It's what a child does. It's sort of the, the play thing of Jesus in the morning is to trample on sin. Um, and then you see the mother, again, so nonchalant. <laughs> and the man there, who we can assume is Joseph, looks on just with out really understanding what's going on next to him. Again, looking on really oblivious to the scenario. Again, I think Joseph is a much well-needed representation of the world here. Just looking on, not really understanding the, the magnitude of Christ's presence, what this Christ child is going to mean, what his ministry is going to unfold like. You get all of human creation pulled together in one piece here and it's just absolutely stunning art and it pulls your eyes to to this child trampling on on sin i think it's absolutely fantastic so i say hot on that well we're going to go ahead and wrap up this again send us your questions and comments tell us what you think are these hot not or sanctified how did you feel about this um, what do they do for you again you can subscribe to our channel on youtube and with that have a blessed day